give people a minute. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Alwyn Levage and welcome to the Marco Academy webinar series. This is our fourth installment and today we are going to Today we are going to unpack the challenges of opening your own speciality coffee house. So today I actually have a very special guest. His name is John Allen. He's the coffee roaster and he is the owner of Onyx Coffee Lab. So without further ado, I'll let John introduce himself and say a few words about himself and Onyx. All right, appreciate you guys showing up. And uh, thanks to Marco for inviting us um, to do this uh, fun little event. Talking about uh, Onyx is, is uh, easier than talking about myself here. Uh, Onyx has been around uh, for about a decade now and we are a uh, consulting um, coffee roaster and a few cafes here in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, we mainly specialize in the coffee industry uh, itself. So that's can be training roasters, designing cafes, helping baristas, helping um, source green coffee, and then also uh, roasting and distributing our own coffee over to uh, industry professionals. Uh, we are uh, about a team of 80. Uh, both my wife and I uh, run the company. And, um, and yeah, it's been, a, it's been a really great time. I myself kind of hold a few different hats. I, I was uh, mainly specializing in sourcing um, and have since on uh, hired a new green coffee buyer who is much better than I am and uh, younger and, and smarter. And so um, I mostly manage the creative aspects from day to day now, uh, whether that's uh, architecture uh, or uh, brand design um, and then still work on the quality control side of uh, roasting profiles and uh, final purchases for Green Bay. Yeah, I think that, that, that wraps Brilliant. it up well. Brilliant. Okay, so before we launch into the questions today, I just have one housekeeping rule, and that is we're going to have a QA and a at the end. So if anyone has any questions for John, you can just throw them into the Q&A box, either at the top of your screen or the bottom of your screen. So that's it. And we'll launch into the first question, John. So what should I know before I open a coffee shop? Oh, man. Um, so this is probably the most asked question that I get. Uh, and I think it, I don't know, it, there's multiple answers to this. I mean, I think it's good to really know your end goal uh, before you really start, um, because we all get into coffee uh, or the cafe industry for so many reasons, right? And so it could be for community and you've worked as a barista and this feels like a uh, natural career path towards growth. Um, right. Could be uh, more financial that you wanna enter the industry itself um, and you see a hole maybe in your neighborhood or in the market. And so I think really understanding why you wanna start a cafe is, is probably a good thing to just sit and round down because from there, you can basically create a web of expectations, right? If it's, it's for financial gain, um, you may need to think through what that truly looks like. If, if it just seems fun and it's more community oriented, you may want to look at your time allocation and have a realization that this is a lot of work. Um, you know, if you're really just passionate about coffee, but not with people, uh, that has its own um, issues within the cafe, as once you become a cafe owner, you work less in coffee and more with people. And so I think really having that understanding is helpful. Yeah, brilliant. So that brings us to our second question today, which is when I open up, should I start with a roastery, a cafe, or should I start with both? Probably mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely not say both. Uh, the rest is kind of a cop out, but um, they're both very different skill sets and, and honestly, from a capital standpoint, it's two totally different restraints there, um, or constraints. I, you know, part of this depends again, sort of like the answer to the first question. If you are 
in my opinion, if you're a very coffee passionate coffee board, someone that's worked in the industry for a while, um, you know, going with a roastery may be a better bet as, uh, as you know, a cafe is really about people. Um, it's about culture and people and you happen to be serving coffee and there are definitely coffee elements and things you can do, but as like an owner of a cafe, when wearing all the hats, you'll just have so little time to actually work with coffee that, um, that may be one of kind of how you want to allocate your decision. Uh, both is a very hard, hard thing to, to accomplish at one time. Yeah. Difficult to balance. I can imagine for sure. Yes. So the third question is how can you go about green coffee sourcing? Hmm. Yeah, this uh, is an interesting question. I think probably you'd want to define what that sourcing is, right? Is that um, your atypical marketing where you see the person backpacking the mountains of Colombia, or is this calling an importer and talking to your buying coffees and, and right. sourcing coffee? I mean, uh, you know, I guess the first step would be, um, you know, to have an understanding of of what you want to do and if there is a company that has that need there's not a lot of green coffee buyers out there and so uh, it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be a goal uh, but we do I know personally from our, from our own company that uh, I get asked a lot about becoming a green buyer um, and it's there's a lot of romance in green buying that doesn't exist in real life with a lot of spreadsheets and uh, financial balancing and position that's not the fun thing to talk about, but that, that's the reality of it. Uh, from there, though, if you, if you have the opportunity, um, you know, I would lean on importers to start with and really talk and ask a lot of questions so that you uh, have a really healthy understanding of the way the industry works, from the financial markets to uh, the real needs of producers to realistic goals. And then um yeah the last step is really if you're if you're actually wanting to go to source and, and wear both hats and fill the entire supply chain uh then the best bet is just to, to start going and make some contacts you know maybe over social media someone that is interested uh in helping host you so that you can start to create a relationship the main the main issue with that only being that you would want to make sure you're sensitive financially to the producer you're working with and talking through that that initial time frame so that's you know Absolutely. not buying 50 pounds of coffee from someone that maybe hosts you in their home for a week and is trying to teach you the industry um, things like that so uh, making sure that there's a clear understanding but but also just okay. you know having the courage to just go out and travel Brilliant. So that smoothly brings us to question four, which is what's next in coffee? Mm. Very broad question. <laughs> yeah. Go. The next in coffee is my, is my next coffee. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, for, for us, I think we're seeing such talent in home espresso and home brewing. Uh, I think you know, we have, in a way, it's a way to applaud the specialty industry. Uh, I know for being in coffee now for over 15 years, I mean, we basically always said our goal is to educate the customer, right? Like, whether that's about quality coffee, maybe it's brew science or well, whatever it is that we continually have us pushed at on us and, um, and then therefore regurgitate and push on the, on the customer. Um, it's always been kind of this education or appreciation. I would say that, I'm not saying that's not important now, but I would also say that it's worked. <laughs> uh, probably the most complex questions were emailed every day about coffee is not um, from industry professionals, but it's from home consumers uh, that want to get into the nitty gritty of extraction theory and all sorts of experimentation. And so uh, for us, what's next? feels um, like helping support uh, non-industry people that are very knowledgeable within the industry, which I think is a new place for coffee. Uh, I don't think we've been there before where uh, you know, the person in line uh, 
is, is knowledgeable in, in a lot of careers and, and, okay. and how then we can relate to that, which actually eases some of the workload of, of the industry itself, right? Because now we have a shared passion. Um, okay. We have a, a language that is normalized where we can communicate back and forth uh, to talk through flavor and brewing. Um, so I see that as a, as a big mix. Uh, at least for roasters, yeah. Brilliant. Right, so question five is, how can someone compete or train in coffee or global competitions? Uh, easy, you just sign up on the form. That's it, just sign up. Just sign uh, up? No, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the first step would probably be watching a lot of competitors you know, online or something so that you can get an understanding. Uh, you know, coffee competitions um, is as much about the rules as it is about innovation. And so I think it's understand um, the, the box that you can compete in and how that works. And then from there, getting really creative with inside of it. Um, but really knowing, you know, times and rules and structures and what's allowed. Um, after that, it's you know bringing something new to the industry, uh, an idea. Maybe it has to do with sensory science, or maybe it has to do with more culture. But, but I think it's always best to bring something fresh to it, and then to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And um, that seems to be a, a method, uh, at least in our own experience, that has worked well. Okay, practice makes perfect, right? That's right. That's right. Basically. Okay, so that brings us swiftly to our Q&A. So I have some Q&A questions I can see here in the Q&A box, just bear with me a moment. Just before I launch into the Q&A, just to remind people, I'll actually do a blog with leftover questions that we couldn't get to answer today. So don't worry if your question is not answered. Okay, so the first question here is how can I best analyze the demographic in my area for, for needs as it relates to new coffee shop? It relates to a new coffee shop. What are some tools for gathering this information? Yeah, um, that's a pretty broad question depending on where you're at. I think, right. uh, you know, if you're just looking at how to analyze whether like, for instance, like the density of cafes to population is gonna be an issue. Um, that can be done fairly simple with a little bit of Google research uh, as far as like where you're needing to go. But I think, um, I think more so it'd be again, understanding uh, what you're wanting to do and then seeing if, if that need fits there. So if, you know, just starting a cafe is, a, is kind of a broad, or a coffee shop is sort of a broad thing. I mean, are you, okay. I don't think just coming in the mindset of just a coffee shop is, is gonna be the right approach anymore. I think there needs to be some sort of differentiator. So is that, you know, specialized in high-end specialty coffee? Is that a good food program? Are you focused on cyclers? Do you have a community that you are gonna fit within that demographic? And, and it should be a natural fit. Um, I don't, from my experience in, in the consulting we do, we don't see a lot of success when someone outside of the hospitality industry sees a hole in the market and decides to go fill it with a coffee shop. Um, normally that results in uh, a closure within a year or two. Okay, great. So that brings that us to our next question. Um, oh, you have some, you have some admirers. Uh, hi, John, how are you? Mm. Uh, how did you, sorry, have you incorporated automation into your cafes and have you, your customers benefited? That's a great question. Mm, good one. Um, so the, our, our most recent cafe, this is pre-COVID, we basically opened one month before COVID hit, which was fantastic. Yeah. Um, we uh, actually deliver our drinks through a conveyor belt system out into uh, wow. into the lobby, which you know is is 
I guess, automation to the tin. Um, but that has been interesting ways in which um, customers receive their drinks with, uh, without Maybe. actually having any hand-to-hand -hand contact, which makes us feel very prophetic, but was more of a design concept. Uh, I think, you know, as far as other automation tools, I mean, uh, we have played with our POS system and our cafe layout. Um, I mean, I'm constantly doing this. I, I do a lot of design work for other cafes. And so I'm, I'm really, really always trying to kind of like dig into what is going to be the most efficient, but also allow the most freedom of conversation from barista to customer uh, yeah. without any physical or social barriers in front of them. So uh, not to plug Marco, but simple like under counter boilers, things that things that allow you to see someone look them in the eye and carry on a real conversation while while moving um, yeah. has been huge for us. So anytime we can re remove that barrier, uh, that automation, Absolutely. That, that's what you mean by the definition has helped. Exactly. I feel the chat between barista and customer is, is super important for the kind of experience on the day, you know? So that kind of brings us yeah. to our, oh, sorry, did you want to say something? No, 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 you're, you're right. I mean, it, okay. it basically every, every question that has been asked, it's like, you can kind of go back to the point that in a cafe, your, your product can have a negative connotation, but your product or your goal is people and not coffee, right? And so priority for sure. Correct. That actually brings us smoothly to our next question, which is, do you typically design your own cafe spaces or do you rely on outside designers? Uh, we do. We design, if this is a personal question, we design all our, our spaces. We tend to take about two years per cafe, sometimes three. Um, and... Uh, yeah, some of that is just like what kind of architecture we're into or art at the time. Others are, you know, we try to take into consideration the community that we have around. This is a little bit harder if you are, you know, expanding incredibly fast. Uh, for us, we, we don't have plans outside of Northwest Arkansas. And so each brick and mortar location we choose is, is a very slow, tenuous process. Um, but that with the idea that we're creating sort of a, a little biosphere within the cafe, right? Like a holistic uh, approach from customer to right. where the barista is, um, to the style of service or the menu itself. So all of that I think is super important and, and it also plays into yeah. a big part of the, the culture for your staff so that, um, you know, I think when we're consulting or helping others design, usually what we end up seeing is you know, there's a large allocation of budget for the lobby to make it really pretty and nice. And then basically like, you know, they just throw a coat of paint where the barista's at. And, and um, I can't speak enough to how important it is to invest in both the aesthetics and the workflow of the bar itself so that uh, there's a pride there and there's a culture there and where you're working. Absolutely. It's great to hear that it's every cafe is so considered in order to kind of maximize the success, success of, each, of each establishment, really. It's great to hear that. Um, we'll move on to another question. So out to the future, what are the most significant threats to sustaining a cafe, the future of broader ca coffee? That's an interesting one. That's good. Uh, question. Could you say that one more time so I can Ab answer it properly? Absolutely, absolutely. I'll read it one more time. So look out to the future, what are the most significant threats sustaining a cafe, the future of broader coffee? Yeah, that's a great question. There's probably multiple answers to this, but I mean, from the, from the most broad sense, if you're taking a really top-down view, um, you know, I think there's climate change and a little bit of the social standing of coffee and, and all of it as an industry uh, can be very scary and also can can be concerning. I don't think it's as dire, this is just me personally, not full scientists as, um, as some make it out because I think the, the increased growth of Ch uh, coffee in China and other areas that are 
colder and warming up, we'll always be producing. We're seeing really exciting things coming out of Yunnan right now. Um, so, you know, I think from a supply chain standpoint, there will be coffee, but um, the funds will change. Uh, the financials will definitely change. Uh, and they should. Uh, coffee, as we, we all know, has uh, been very lopsided in the balance of fund allocation. And so um, it's time for some of that to be corrected. From a more localized standpoint, um, you know, doing doing business is just uh, getting more expensive by the day. I think if you go to the nuts and bolts logistically, it's very hard to open uh, open a cafe just because all fixed costs are rising quite a bit. Um, you know, we started our first cafe and um, before it was even Onyx in 2008 had a cafe and, and rent and labor and cost of goods and things like that um, were just so much lower. And when we think about the pricing structure that we have for coffee, uh, this idea of what a coffee should cost has not really changed that much. I mean, it, it does to maybe a high-end specialty department and we sort of feel like it is changing a little bit and maybe it increases 20% here, 30% there, um, or certain like high-end varieties get really expensive, but the, the fixed asset costs are what is really going up. So um, we will need to find ways of offsetting that. And I think there's a lot of really clever companies out there doing that. And that's why you're seeing great food programs pop up and, um, you know, merchandising and retail expanding and things like that. Is I think you need something to help off offset that. Okay. Okay, well, well answered. Um, this is a lovely one. Um, Onyx are famous for their delicious menus. What is your favorite drink? Oh. Hmm. Gosh, I don't. That's. Tough question. This is the hardest question that's been asked. Ah. <laughs> hardest question, yes. <laughs> I, I just normally drink black coffee because I'm a fake, but um, I mean, Honestly, a good a good cappuccino feels like dessert now, and so uh, I feel very spoiled when that ends up happening. Lovely. Um, I mean, Lovely. as far as yeah, I don't know that the creative drinks. There's Dylan, who is our head trainer and also helps create our menus, comes up with you know amazing things every year. Right now, there's yeah, he's got this kind of yuzu uh, inspired tea soda that's fantastic. So maybe we'll go with that. Brilliant. Okay, so yeah. the next question is, how have you adapted your operations to the new pandemic world that we are currently living in? What opportunities do you think will arise from it? We've kind of already touched on this, but I think it, we could definitely develop it maybe. Yeah. Um, so, oh gosh, what a disaster. <laughs> I know. Uh, I, originally, we uh, we shut down the first week. It really became known as a pandemic to reevaluate um, and started serving out windows the following week and have been doing that uh, ever since until last week when we first uh, opened one of the cafes. So we've been closed Amazing. For, in, for inside, um, yeah, up until last week. Uh, and that was basically to give a chance for all our staff to get their second shot and get vaccinated and then and then once that um, time span cleared we were kind of good to go so from a from a labor standpoint that's how that sort of worked i mean but real dramatic shifts the way we stayed alive uh is for us we really had never put a large focus on e-commerce um before we were as i said previously onyx was built around the concept that we were coffee for coffee people our um, quote unquote demographic has always been, you know, baristas and in the hospitality industry to begin with. We take a lot of pride that both Andrew and I grew up working coffee our whole lives and, and that's right. who our friends and family were. And so that's always what we've been focused on. So uh, while we obviously serve and sell to, to what I'll call normal people, <laughs> uh, that was never our focus until the pandemic when, you know, cafes were shutting down and, um, Basically, we, we were still roasting coffee, trying to figure out what to do. So we really focused on the consumer side, uh, especially on e-commerce and direct-to-homes. And that uh, 
has been fantastic in that we've been able to retain pretty much everyone uh, at Onyx and um, and have really grown that side of our of our platform and probably that forced us. So if I was, I'm an optimist. So I would say, you know, it was it was a good opportunity to force us into something uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and we're still learning that platform even now, but it has become a big part of who we are and we don't think that that's leaving. So. Uh, Good yeah. answer. Good answer. I feel, I certainly feel like e-commerce has been a massive savior during this difficult, difficult time really. And yeah, I, I can't, I can't see it leaving. I agree. Yeah. So the next question is, how do you pick the best location for your cafe? What do you look for? Well, there's, there's two answers to this because there's us personally and we don't always do, do it right and there's, there's others. Uh, personally, we look for a place we wanna be and less about the demographics. Um, you know, if you are a, a roasting company um, like we are, then our cafes are more the face of our business, but not the bulk of our business. And therefore we are really looking more towards which communities we want to be in um, or a place that we think is underrepresented with specialty coffee and, and sort of doing something special there. Uh, if this is your first cafe and you're just going, um, you know, there are real tangibles to consider and things like parking or you know, how much walk-up traffic you're receiving, things like that. Um, you know, your relationship to other cafes within the area. I think uh, it's really important to be a good neighbor. And so you should really be somewhat consider at least of uh, the local cafes in your area. If there's a really great spot you could lease, but there's something within a block it might be better to pass that up long-term. It might be a short-term gain if it's a good spot, but it might be a long-term um, disaster. You know, if it's a Starbucks or something next door, I'm, you know, I don't think you need to stress it so much. But uh, I would say that's the first and foremost look on. There's gonna be a train that's about to come. That's no problem. Here, so. <laughs> this is what working from looks uh, like. That's right, I'm at the roastery <laughs> right now, so. Um, Apologize for the noise, but yeah, that, that, you know, if you're not in a very pedestrian oriented city, if you're in the Midwest or something, I mean, you know, parking and, and um, access is, is really important. I would also be considerate of the architecture of the building itself. Uh, you know, when choosing a space, uh, there's a lot more that goes into creating a shop than what most people think, especially landlords. So like, you know, me and landlords are basically enemies at all times, but like understanding the amount of power and amperage you're gonna need, the floor drains, especially beautiful old buildings where you all of a sudden are gonna have to cut through the floors and like reorient all your plumbing and drains like those nice. from a cost standpoint or from an architecture standpoint become a real issue. So I would understand your MEP and um, I would hire an MEP engineer before I moved forward on too many spots. Uh, Interesting. Because I can save okay. you in the long run. Yeah. Okay. Our next question actually kind of brings us back to e-commerce a little bit. So the question is, what would you say has been some of the fundamental keys to Onyx's rapid success, specifically in e-commerce? I'm like, should not be the expert saying this. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I mean, for, for our online presence, um, maybe it's because again, we are coffee for coffee people. We have always, you know, from a social media standpoint, posted our own inside jokes and our own uh, things that we like and it has seemed to resonate well. Um, you know, I, one thing that we are proud of that we hope to continue to do is we have really empowered our staff, especially the ones in sort of leadership positions and tried to make uh, make them some of the face of Onyx itself. And so if that's Dylan or Josh or Dakota or Lance, or Alika, 
Mark, all these people that have been with us for years and years and years that then take on either their own personalities or go on to do their own businesses. Um, you know, we are mindful of, of those people that are have either been with us for even a few short years or for the, for the long haul and putting them up in the forefront um, because it's more authentic and it just resonates well. I, I think people are pretty good at understanding what is real and what is not. And so um, you know, we've sat in a lot of marketing meetings and you know, we've talked with a lot of firms about what we should be doing. And we always come back to the fact that it feels very inauthentic. So for us, at least, um, it has always stayed in house. So all our creative from social media to branding to web design, everything is in house. Um, and we think that's really important. So we won't use an outside firm uh, to help us with our with our work uh, because we, we want people to no coffee to be surrounded by the baristas themselves and also to be able to do something very quickly and, and just put it out there and that i don't know if that's why we're successful but that's what we've been doing well you seem to be doing a great job and from a digital marketing <laughs> perspective i completely agree with you so it's about keeping the personality kind of you know keeping up with the personality of the brand without making it too stuffy or inauthentic as you said yeah. So the next question is, I'm really trying to power through these, we have about 21 still left. Um, is it better to go through an importer or directly from the farmers for green beans? What would you recommend? We've kind of already touched on this a little bit. Yeah, I, the, key, the key word there is good. Uh, I don't know that either is, is better than the other right away. Um, some of it is what you can do yourself and what you can promise and then what you're exactly looking for. I mean, I, I don't think you should start, if, you, if you're starting out, I don't think starting out, assuming that like you can fly to East Africa and journey through Nairobi's auction and Addis and, and find a bunch of coffee and bring it home. Uh, that it's just an unrealistic narrative. So in that aspect, I think developing good relationships with good importers that are doing things right, um, that maybe have some transparency to how they operate, and then slowly developing real relationships with producers. So relationship is like a, speaking of, of authenticity is a word that is thrown around a lot, but it's, it's not a relationship with a coffee farmer if you text them once a year about your order, right? and you buy coffee. So we, I think we need to reevaluate the word choice, um, you know, about how that works and how you would call a relationship both in your local presence and, and with how you buy coffee in general. But that being said, obviously we're huge proponents of uh, buying from producers of, of theoretically cutting out the middleman and sending more money to the farm itself. Um, the problem is that that actually has to be done, right? So if you're gonna cut 50 cents off your green coffee because you're not paying that to someone who's making a sale, uh, you actually still have to reincorporate that money to the producer. And that is uh, the crux of what we see that doesn't happen a lot is, you know, it's easy. I mean, large roasters have been direct trade for hundreds of years, right? It's much easier to take advantage of someone when you're buying directly. So. Um, it's good to understand that quote unquote direct trade or relationship right. coffee or whatever the trendy word for buying from a producer is at the moment. Um, it's why we think full transparency is really important because there, there needs to be some published trail there to really have an understanding of why it matters. Otherwise, I would say yeah. Yeah, make, make good relationships with maybe smaller importers, right? There's a lot of boutique importers out there that don't work with every origin, but just work in one country. And we usually find that they, you know, find better coffees because they're very, they're very focused. And that doesn't mean they're, they're necessarily better or that the big guys are bad, but, you know, if you are talking to an importer that only works in Ethiopia, um, 
the chances are you're going to find some really nice coffees and also you have a good finger on the pulse of the culture and what you need to be doing. Okay. Those are some really, really good tips of sourcing, sourcing your coffee. Um, the next question is an interesting one, but I think it's great. Um, any books that you can suggest to learn and understand roasting and coffee extractions? Um, yes, I mean, there are, there are a lot of books out there, you know, Scott Rayo books and um, more recently James Hoffman or um, the old Amazing. kind of CQI uh, library of <laughs> large volumes of coffee technology and things like that. Um, I think part of the issue is that coffee, coffee science I'll say is changing a lot. And a lot of it, is, in my opinion, is pseudoscience. And um, you can pretty much prove anything you want with brew theory and extraction with a different book. Uh, so it is, I think it's good to be well-rounded with that and learn it. And then also just to decide what you like, right? Um, you know, what are you looking for in coffee? Because the artistry really comes in roasting when you know the flavors um, and sort of the language that you want to speak in coffee. And so I'm not a proponent of saying there's one right way to roast a coffee. I think uh, it truly has to be with what you're, what kind of expression you're wanting to look through. And then that also allows the brand that you're creating to have um, not just a reputation, but a an understanding of what the coffees are going to be like, right? So it's not that you're just a light roaster or a Nordic roaster or a dark roaster or approachable, but that um, these are the types of coffees we bring in and these are the ways we like to roast it in order to get these types of flavors. Okay. For us, we're always, you know, sweetness and acidity are our two main features. We're always looking for sweetness and acidity. Okay. Uh, and I as we tend to buy coffees, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, if you, it's kind of on the spot right now. So if you feel you, you can think of a book later on, we can kind of insert it into the blog that we will write after this um, mm. with follow-up questions that we didn't get to answer today. Maybe we can insert more. Um, no, that's, that's great. And, and honestly, leaving coffee and more reading about sensory science, I think, would be more helpful than a focused study on coffee roasting. So learning to taste on all sorts of things will be far more valuable than, I, you know, learning one profile to one variety okay. that someone uses on a different roaster at a different elevation, a different barometric pressure. Okay. It's, it's almost unrelatable. So our next question is, how important is it to invest in scalability as we grow as a roaster while keeping our quality? That is a great question. Mm -hmm. um, that is really, really hard. Uh, I think there has to be a choice from the beginning. Uh, you need to make a foundation and decide if what you're willing to compromise with and what you're not. Because um, once you start deciding that along the way, you will basically make those compromises no matter what, because life gets hard and things get expensive and maybe you get a family or something happens and you need to make more money and all of a sudden that makes those compromises much easier. So I do think setting the standard from the beginning is super important and then maintaining that standard with your staff um, going forward, because otherwise... It's too easy to change. As far as the actual logistics of scaling and quality, um, it's it's really really hard. And I, you know, I don't. I'm not even saying that we've done it right, but I do think slow growth um, is important. Uh, you know, you should, and theoretically, you should be hampered by the, the quality of coffee you can purchase. Um, okay. And not necessarily by what you can roast, right? So. Okay. That's, you're only going to be as good as what the coffee you find. I think that's going to be the okay. most important. You're never taking a, a bad or decent coffee and roasting so well that it's fantastic, right? Yeah. Everything inherently is already in that green coffee. Um, and, you know, we have to, you're going to pay for that green coffee quite a bit. And so when you start making those compromises budgetary-wise there, that's when it goes downhill. 
Okay. Our next question is um, interesting enough because it kind of shows the variety of people who are listening today. And um, the next question is, I'm a chef by training hired to manage the opening of a new cafe. I don't have the rule book for managing coffee, but I know how to manage food. I'm excited to play by my own rules. What might be a coffee rule that you wouldn't break? And what is a rule that you have broken that has been hugely successful? Great question from wow, Brandon. That's a, yeah, that's a great <laughs> you need question. need me to read it again, I will. Uh, I'm reading it up here now. Uh, yeah, really well articulated. I'm excited for you to be able to do that. I think um, well I think you have the right idea that playing by your rules is a, is a smart is a smart idea. I think it helps differentiate yourself. And also, uh, you know, there are there are a lot of cafes out there doing a lot of great things. Um, so becoming individualistic with that is not a not a terrible idea. I don't know that there's really a rule that you can't break. I mean, if if you take since you're a chef. Uh, and we talk about this as a roasting company. Um, coffee is an ingredient, first and foremost. That, that, that's all it is. And so, um, you know, our job is basically to make this ingredient, or we say paint sometimes, that we create all this paint and we make the best paint possible. And then we sell it to artists and we let them design, right? And so we're not going to tell you how to use our coffee in certain ways because. Uh, we've seen many cafes use a coffee, one of our coffees in a better way than we ever thought possible and we'll actually adopt it and, and serve it in the cafe that way. And so I think when you can leave everything out other than just this raw ingredient and you decide what the best way to work with it is, um, you know, if it tastes good and, and you're enjoying it, then that's, that's what's going to end up being a recipe for success. No differently than how you would treat a protein or a vegetable or something else, right? Uh, it's just an ingredient. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Hope that helps. It's a great question. Um, the next question is, it's an interesting one again. How do you recruit, train, and maintain staff in your shop? Yeah, it's hard. Um, that's probably, that'd be more a question for my wife, Andre, who is head of operations here, but um, you try your hardest and you, you fail at it, and then you try again and try something new and fail at it, and you slowly, <laughs> you slowly get it figured out, and then you realize you don't have anything figured out. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, culture is such a buzzword, but it's, it's really important. Um, to set a tone. I mean, as far as finding the right person, uh, you know, for us, um, we are not looking for coffee knowledge. Uh, we're only looking at personality when we hire, um, okay. no matter what. We, we actually want to train. We would prefer to train the knowledge and not have bad habits, especially when it comes to baristas and things like that. So we are you're purely looking for pe people and culture fits um, and then taking care of the education ourselves. Uh, I think that's pretty important. When it comes to real key figures, I think it's allowing people to have growth and to expand. Um, sometimes it feels like, and, and because we, you know, I grew up as a barista, uh, like there's a ceiling and a cap, or maybe maybe the one promotion is becoming a manager, um, and that becomes, you know, uninspiring to say the least if you're wanting a career in coffee, and so. Um, yeah, it's important to, have, to be able to create um, positional changes as the company grows so that people can grow. And if there is a ceiling there and maybe it's in a position someone is not set up for success, that you help move that into a new role, whether that's helping a barista open their own cafe or um, moving them into a new position. But yeah, I think keeping keeping the challenge and the excitement and, and the idea of upward mobility is, is really important within within the staff itself. And and also being okay with knowing that like you're gonna fail and that uh, you know people are gonna get ups, upset sometimes. I mean it, it's we have sure. a staff of an 80, 80 to a hundred now. Um, we're very close with our staff, but at the same time, you know, they're 
they're doing us a favor by working for us. We're hoping we're doing a favor by employing them. And um, there has to be, you know, a separation there that you're learning. And sometimes it just doesn't, doesn't work out. And that's okay, too. Uh, sometimes people right. will be upset. And well answered. Okay, I'm so sorry, guys. We actually have come to the end, sadly come to the end of the webinar. So there are many questions still in there. There's about 21 we've yet to answer. So I'm going to fire these over to John and we're going to answer them in the next week or so. And I'll create a blog and put it up on our website. Thank you so much for coming to this webinar. John, you've been fantastic, very insightful. I hope everyone has taken away at least a few tips from John. And if you've missed, if your friends wanted to watch it and they missed it, we will be uploading this to our social channels either, I think, tomorrow. So thank you so much for listening again and have a lovely day. And yeah, see you at the next one. Bye. Well, thanks so much. Bye, Appreciate guys. Bye-bye. All right.